Alright, this is Joe Ancola with OKRaw.com. Today we have another exciting episode for you and I'm here with my friend Dr. Rick Dina to share some very important tips with you. Uh, Dr. Rick has been on a raw foods diet for longer than me. Like how long Rick? 30 years. Wow, 30 years. Definitely an expert in his field. I've been doing it myself for 23 years. In this episode, we're going to share you guys the top 12 tips on how you guys can maintain and more importantly, be successful on a raw foods diet for a long period of time. It, it makes me quite sad when I see people get into raw foods and then within a year or two, they jump ship. I mean, you can find many YouTubers making videos who used to do raw and now they don't even do it. And maybe they even deleted all their old raw food videos because they're like, <laughs> that doesn't work, it's crap. But it doesn't have to be and that's why I'm making this video because I'm so passionate about this topic that you know raw foods, definitely some of the healthiest foods on the planet if you're doing it right and that's what you'll be learning in this episode. So. Dr. Rick, let's go over these top 12 tips for my people. Good. So John just gave me the topic about a minute ago, so impromptu <laughs> here, but it so happens that my wife, Dr. Karen Dina, and I, she's been at it almost 30 years also, made this uh, top 12 strategies for long-term success on a raw food plant-based diet, which you can actually get as a free ebook when you join our email list at rawfoodeducation.com. So we're going to just have the, uh, the content page here and uh, go over these really briefly. And John's going to have some comments for us too because at 23 years in, he knows what he's talking about. And as, as all of you viewers know, John's got a lot of good stuff to share also. So hey, Thanks, Dr. Rick. Yeah, and for those of you guys that sign up for his, uh, his email list, you'll get the copy of the book. But I know a lot of you guys aren't readers and you'd rather listen. And so that's why I'm doing the video. For you guys there, but if you need to refresh your course, you can always rewind the video, rewatch it, um, or actually join his email list, which I would recommend. Yep, so here we go. And now we, we came up with this a couple of years ago, and I, I haven't reviewed it uh, just recently, but you know, nevertheless, I think we can uh, cover things pretty well. So, number one, number one of the top 12 is get educated. How can you be successful at anything if you're not well educated about it? Now, interestingly, we, we love science, we love scientific research and studies, so to put two and two together, back in 2008, Columbia University did a study of people who attended a raw vegan health institute, and they gave them a questionnaire at the beginning, and then, you know, they filled out a bunch of stuff, and then they followed them, or they recontacted them about three months later to see who was compliant, who was sticking with it, and who wasn't. And what they found is, of the people sticking with it, there were three factors that they noted at the beginning that stood out that were strongly correlated with sticking with it later on. Number one was education. The more well-educated the people were about raw food diets in the first place, guess what? The more likely they were to be sticking with it several months later because they actually knew what they were doing. Number two was interesting, it was actually severity of disease. So if you're eating pizza, eating gummy bears, um, bagels and cream cheese, you know, all, all the typical junk that people eat, and you feel great, and you're getting the most out of life, why would you give those things up? But, as, as I know, John, you've shared with some of your viewers, when it's, it's, it may be life and death. And it may be like the difference between you have aches and pains all the time versus you don't and you feel great and, and, and you know, huge differences in your life. If you're one of those people, you're going to stick with it. Okay, that pizza may taste good, but it's not worth not being able to walk in some people's cases or, you know, having some debilitating thing like rheumatoid arthritis or, or other issues. So... Um, for people it really matters for, it's worth sticking with it. The, the, the taste of that food is not worth the health cost. So that to me made a lot of sense. And then number three was rather interesting. It, they, they termed it kind of in a technical way. They termed it self-efficacy to adhere. I wasn't actually sure what that was. <laughs> what the heck is that? <laughs> I, I'll admit it. I'm more of a science guy than a vocabulary guy. So I, I looked up self-efficacy in the dictionary. And it said it's, it's basically confidence in oneself and achieving goals. So John just gave the example when we were talking about it. If your goal is to run a marathon and you train for a year or so and then you do it, 
you have confidence that you can achieve goals, whether in business, relationships, uh, personal goals, whatever the case may be, is if you're good at setting out on something and, and following through, that's going to work in any endeavor in life, including sticking with a raw food diet. So all important considerations, but number one was education. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with the education part. I think it's important when you get educated, get the proper education and get a good education <laughs> from qualified people <laughs> yeah. that are teaching good information. You know, just because you go on YouTube and listen to some YouTuber talk about raw foods doesn't mean they know what the heck they're talking about, right? <laughs> Anybody could get a camera, even, you know, a cell phone these days and start making YouTube videos. You know, I've made, geez, over 500 videos on this channel. I've been doing a raw foods diet. 23 years now I have a lot of experience so I share my experiences and knowledge with you and I think I'm fairly <laughs> I know what I'm talking about right or I'll, I'll second the motion <laughs> likewise dr. Rick you know he's been doing it even longer than me when I got into raw foods I looked up to dr. Rick and I mean I still do uh, for a lot of the information that likewise. I that I've learned and, and continue to teach on a daily basis because he has and has done the research and and knows his stuff so I would recommend for Further education uh, by him and his wife's uh, book. So, Rick, you want to talk about your book real fast? Just yeah, that's as, as good that's source of education besides watching my videos and other respected, trusted sources of that's, information. That's a good place to start. So, it's called the Raw Food Nutrition Handbook, available on Amazon. Uh, Dr. Karen Dina is the primary author. I'm sort of the with helper. You know, I wrote a couple chapters and I helped her proofread and organize it a bit. But boy, she spent like two years in front of the computer, at times not hanging out with me, in front of the computer doing a lot of research separate from the research that we teach in our classes. Um, and it's very, very detailed and organized about the best sources of calcium and other minerals and, and you know, all sorts of stuff that you, it's not just repeating rhetoric. This is stuff that, that is really solid. And a lot of people have said that uh, from reading that book, they've just got such a, a grip on, on what they can do and so much confidence in doing it in the right way. So uh, thanks for mentioning that. I, was, I wasn't even going to mention that, but yeah, no. nevertheless, it is, it is a good resource. I'd recommend that as probably like the number one raw foods book because it, it, it gives you a solid approach so that you can definitely be sure to be successful if you follow the tips and uh, what they're saying in there, right? Yep. So yeah, so Rick, uh, what is number two? So number two is, um, well, the next three are sort of uh, help people overcome myths because certain things in certain camps outside of raw food and with certain camps within the raw food movement, certain foods are bad or taboo. And, you know, we think everything has their place, uh, you know, within a, a general healthy paradigm. Not just anything goes, but appropriately and rationally done, different foods have their place. So, number one is get educated. Number two, eat enough fruit. And can't emphasize how important that is. Because if you're not eating grains and beans and meat and dairy products and processed foods, then you just want to eat a raw food diet. Well, what do you have? You have fruits, you have vegetables, you have uh, sprouted nuts and seeds or unsprouted nuts and seeds. You know, maybe some things like some microgreens kind of falls in the vegetable category. And, um, and along with fat and seeds, maybe some avocados. So basically fruits and vegetables and fat sources. If you are avoiding fruit because you think fruit's going to cause diabetes or, or cause various problems. And by the way, I want to say in my clinical experience and working with people for many years, including many, many high fruit raw vegans, it's actually extremely the exception as opposed to the rule that there's blood sugar or triglyceride issues or those types of things. So what happens though is when people hear that fruit's bad and then they try to get the rest of their calories from vegetables and from fat sources as John well knows, you know, you can eat a lot of greens and a lot of vegetables and you can be stuffed and you have like 200 calories in your stomach and you do that several times a day. I mean, if you really go for it and, and you didn't have to go to work that day, maybe you could get 800 calories worth of vegetables in. If you really tried, I mean, your jaw might be sore from all the chewing. I might be exaggerating a little bit, but not too much. So the point is it's really hard to get enough calories just from vegetables. So then people end up going toward the more concentrated sources of calories, 
which it's kind of extreme here. It's like those are really concentrated and people end up eating 50, 60, 70 percent of their calories sometimes from fat, not realizing that like if you loaded up a bunch of lettuce on John and I's lap and filled it up, filled up the whole view of the camera, you would have about the same amount of calories as I could get in a handful of, of say, unsoaked almonds. And I'm not exaggerating. That really sounds extreme, but I'm not exaggerating. So, number one, when people avoid fruit on a raw food diet, they end up eating an awful lot of fat. And when they eat that much fat, people don't always feel their best. They feel heavy, they feel dense, they feel bogged down, and, 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 and then they may keep it up for a little while, stick with it for a little while, but then they say, you know, I felt too dense, it was too heavy, and, and they bail out. And it's like, my God, if we just could have gotten over that hurdle that fruit isn't really bad for you, it's a great food, and you can get more calories from fruit, then you don't have to eat so much fat. Then you feel lighter, and your brain works better, and you're happier, and your body's uh, leaner and stronger, and you have more energy, and you sleep better, and on and on and on. So... Fruit is not the only food that you should eat. John and I are both real clear that a, a complete fruitarian diet is not the healthiest. But do not be afraid of fruit. You can make it a staple in your diet and be extremely healthy and not succumb, you know, 19 times out of 20 at least to the myths that are perpetuated in certain camps. Mm. So the point is, eat enough fruit, but Dr. Rick, what is too much fruit? <laughs> yeah, well, too much fruit is so much fruit that you crowd out vegetables. Mm. Um, and, and that can happen, too, because when people go on, let's say, a fruit and vegetable only diet, you, unless you're eating a lot of bananas and dried fruit, which they can, you know, bananas especially can be staples, and that's fine, but let's just say you're eating a lot of watery fruit. Even with that, even though you've got about three times the calorie density in fruit compared to vegetables, you still have to eat an awful lot of food to get enough calories. So you're eating all this food, you're eating all this food, you're really full, but you're, you still aren't getting enough calories in. But fruit's three times more calorie dense than vegetables. You're going to tend to eat the fruit more often, and then you skimp on the vegetables. And that brings us up to the next one. Number three is eat enough vegetables. <laughs> So again, if you're, if you're, if you're um, going too heavy on the fruit and you're not eating some things that are a bit denser, like a few nuts and seeds, not too many, but a few, and we'll, we'll talk about they, they really come in handy for some minerals as well, then you end up skimping on the vegetables. And then if you're not eating enough vegetables, you are lacking in many minerals that fruit does not provide in nearly as much abundance as vegetables do. So I have met people on raw food diets who were like really low in calcium. I've met people on raw food diets who touted themselves in, as experts who were low in iron and who had yeah, iron deficiency anemia. So fruit is awesome, but it's not the only thing you should eat. Vegetables are absolutely critically important for a variety of phytonutrients that you don't get in fruit and for a variety of minerals that are not nearly as abundant in fruit. I mean, really, really heavy fruit eaters that don't tend to eat enough vegetables, I've been observing this for many decades now, tend to have a lot of teeth and gum problems. They're, they tend to be kind of spacey and out there in the clouds. And you know, time and time again, they get more vegetables in there. Their teeth and gums are healthier. They need a lot less dental care. They have a lot fewer cavities. Their brain works better. They're more focused. So vegetables are just so super important. And anything to add there, John? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You're, you're, John is the, the, the <laughs> grow your the own vegetable here. man, so I'll, I'll, let you, uh, I'll let you share your, your comments. I mean, fruit's definitely really important. I mean, I get a lot of my calories from fruit. It tastes so good. But vegetables, in my opinion, are even more important, in my opinion, because they're often overlooked and missed, right? Fruit tastes so good, you can eat it really easily oh it's so sweet it's so delicious you know juicy drippy mango but then when you think of greens you think of greens you want to eat them you think some kale you buy at the store it tastes bitter it tastes crappy it tastes like garbage <laughs> actually i had some kale earlier today when i was out on my dad's 80th birthday at a, at a restaurant actually and there's a kale salad and like the kale tasted horrible because <laughs> it wasn't fresh out of my garden mm. and you know greens don't have to taste 
that bad. When they start getting old, they start aging. They start not tasting good as good. They don't have as much nutrition in there. And so I want you guys to, you know, as we'll talk about early, uh, later, is, you know, uh, grow your own if you're able to. And if you can't grow outside your own greens, grow microgreens indoors. You could do that anywhere, even if you live in an apartment in New York City. Um, even better, or if you can't do that, then at least shop at the farmer's markets and ask the farmers, hey, when did you pick these greens? The ones that are, you know, like pick that morning are definitely going to be fresher and tastier. And also try to always buy baby greens. They're always going to taste better than the more hardcore, stronger greens. But some of the stronger greens are good too because they may have more different uh, phytonutrients in there because that's the strong flavor compounds and they may be even more like beneficial for preventing cancer and all these kind of things, right? And the other thing I want to point out is that, you know, my main meals in a day, I have three meals primarily. I might have a juice, which is contains lots of vegetables, and that's how I really compress like five to six pounds of vegetables literally in one juice that I drink in the morning. Um, next, I might have a fruit meal or a, a green smoothie meal with fruit and greens. And then for dinner, I'll generally have another green meal. So I'm eating some fruit. But, you know, my first meal is packing the greens by juicing it and you wouldn't be able to eat that many, I wouldn't be able to eat that much vegetables in my breakfast meal if I didn't juice them. Um, and then, of course, uh, for dinner, vegetables with, you know, a little bit of fat. So actually that gets us into the next uh, tip, yeah. Dr. Rick. Eat enough fat. And, you know, I'm probably not quite as heavy on the veggies as John, but I'm pretty solid. So usually there's veggies in, in a green smoothie during the day and then a you know, a gigantic bowl of vegetables that takes me a half an hour to eat that my wife and I eat in the evening. So we're, we're you know, packing in a couple pounds or so, two to three pounds of vegetables per day. And uh, it's really made a difference. In the early years, I was much more fruit heavy and I just started feeling a lot better. Plus, I, I really uh, messed up my teeth in the early fruit days. And, you know, my teeth are just so much healthier these days. And uh, so the vegetables really are just critical there. Um, so yeah, and enough fat, you know, in some camps, fat's the bad guy. And, and you know, you don't want to go excessive on fat, but, but fat is not something to be afraid of. Like we were talking about earlier, if, there, if you're just eating a fruit and vegetable based diet without any extra concentrated fat sources, you've got to really pack in an awful lot of food. And people don't always have that much time in the day to spend that much time eating or or you know, juicing. They don't want to, yeah, or, or <laughs> juicing. Um, and so usually, and, and I think, John, you can say if you're similar, so our, our fat comes in the evening with a huge amount of vegetables. And usually it's in a dressing form with a lot of vegetables and then a little bit of fat in the dressing. And then we pour that over a lot more vegetables. So on the one hand, the fat's not too concentrated because we have a lot of vegetables there. And number two... The, we're, we'll actually get enough calories from our evening salad, whereas without the fat, and it was just the vegetables, we would not be getting enough calories. And then we'd be back to, boy, I, I'm full, but I'm still hungry because I don't have enough calories. I'm physically full, but I'm not satiated. And then we would tend to eat more fruit because it's more calorie dense than vegetables. So that extra fat by having some more concentrated calories actually allows us to eat more vegetables. And those vegetables are awesome sources of minerals that fruit is not as abundant in. And a lot of those fat sources like chia seeds and sesame seeds and walnuts and some of those types of foods are also much richer in key minerals than fruit is. So when we have a healthy, balanced mix like that, we cover all of our needs. So fruit's not the enemy, you just want to make sure it's used in its appropriate place. Vegetables are not the enemy, they're super nutrient dense and they're super low in calories, so eat a lot of them, but don't think you're going to get all your calories from vegetables, because you're, you're just not going to. And fat, especially when appropriately chosen and eaten in context with lighter things like lots of vegetables, can round out the mineral profile of your diet and can make things like vegetables more satisfying because the overall meal is just a little bit denser uh, to get you enough calories uh, to keep going for a while. So fruit, vegetables, and fat all in their appropriate place. None of them are the end-all be-all. None of them should be something that, that are taboo for people because uh, then, then you get thrown out of balance. Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree with everything Dr. Rick said. And then my adding my two cents on fats, basically, I like to do like a handful of nuts, 
uh, a day. And sometimes if I'm generous, like two handfuls. And generally what that works out to be is like, I don't know, I like to stay around 15, 20% fat. Sometimes I'll go up to 25, but I don't like to go too much over that many, uh, that percentage of calories from fat in my personal diet. Um, and the other thing I'd like to say on the fats is that actually when you're adding fats in with some of the phytonutrient rich greens or even fruits, it's going to uh, basically raise the absorption of some of the phytonutrients because it slows down your digestive process. And so even sometimes for a juice, I might, you know, have a few macadamia nuts in my mouth, five or something, chew it up before I drink my juice to kind of get some fats in my digestive system, which might help, you know, me absorb more of the nutrients in the fruits and five macadamia nuts. I mean, well, they're pretty calorically dense right there, but it's and not any significant thing. Or I might add, you know, blend up an avocado with my juicer, actually juice a, a you know, unripe avocado that's been peeled through my juicer to get some extra fat in with my juice as I'm making it. So, you know, I want you guys also to have that option and not be like, I can't eat fats with fruits, it's bad. You want to have any comments on that, that uh, Dr. Well, yeah, so, I mean, there's a lot of categories. John mentioned phytonutrients, like the carotenoids, and it's not just beta carotene. There's, there's hundreds of them. Uh, lutein, zeaxanthin, lycopene, you know, so, you know, so many others with complicated sounding names that are fat soluble. So, number one, there, there are there's about 10 to 15 percent of calories from fat in many vegetables, especially many greens, and they help absorb those important nutrients. But a little bit of extra fat actually has been shown to increase your absorption of those nutrients even more. Now, I'm not saying you need to eat an avocado with every meal. Like we're, we've, Sometimes I've seen people take that too far. But a little bit extra fat in addition to having minerals directly in those fats, depending on the source, you also absorb more other nutrients from your vegetables, and that's another reason why a little bit of fat in a dressing with a large amount of vegetables is an excellent combination. And then there's also, you know, we won't have time to get into all this, but one of my favorite topics about essential fats and omega-6 and 3 balance, that's a whole, can get long and complicated, but it's not hard to do that right with a little bit of basic education. Cool, so what I'll say with that is actually check the link down below because actually I interviewed Dr. Rick about essential fats on a raw foods diet and that's another one, another video you definitely will want to watch. Mm. All right, John, so we're up to number five that actually touches on uh, the, the three we just said. So we don't, said, don't be afraid of fruit, don't be afraid of vegetables, don't be afraid of fat, but then so that kind of covers and we'll take off from that number five, beware of myths that limit your intake of healthy foods. Mm -hmm. So we kind of just covered three of them, but there's more out there eventually. And one of my sort of uh, biggest pet peeves out there is that people say that raw cruciferous vegetables are bad for you, specifically because they block iodine uptake and that damages your thyroid gland. Now there have been one or two extreme case histories written in the peer-reviewed scientific literature that have speculated that large amounts of raw cruciferous vegetables have, have damaged someone. So there was one lady who uh, presented to New York City Hospital in what they called a myxedema coma. Her thyroid function got so low that she just wasn't functioning and she went into a coma. And when they questioned her family members about that, they said that she had been consuming um, two to two and a half pounds of baby bok choy every day for the last several months in hopes that it would help cure her diabetes. And she had a bad outcome. So there's an extreme example, but that does not mean raw cruciferous vegetables are bad for everybody. And one of the reasons this is such a pet peeve of mine is because, you know, ever since early on in my raw food days, I discovered that I love raw cauliflower. It's amazing stuff, and I actually made a video about this uh, one time, and I talked about the, it, it's probably up to, I'm probably up to it 30 years in, about, I have consumed approximately 8,000, <laughs> I'm not kidding, it's about 300 a year, you do the math, about, I eat a head of raw cauliflower almost every day, but I'm saying 300 a year, because sometimes I'm juicing, and sometimes it's expensive or not available, so three, so anyway, eight or so thousand heads of raw cauliflower over the last 30 years, and that includes also, or shall I say in addition to that, lots of tree collards, 
because John has been a good influence on us. We got him growing out in the backyard there. That's collards or cruciferous vegetables. And kale is a staple in my diet as well. Every time I've checked my thyroid, my TSH, T3, T4, and the, um, the thyroid antibodies are all excellent, all optimal. And I'm not suffering from hypothyroidism. As you can see, I'm not a super low energy person, <laughs> especially with John next door. I got to make sure I'm not getting upstage too much here. And, you know, I, I just, so I'm not sluggish. I don't have a bad lipid profile. I'm not losing my hair and my eyebrows. I mean, I'm, I'm, and on all of my lab work numbers look awesome. So when I hear people say, okay, fat's bad, fruit's bad, lettuce is bad, raw cruciferous vegetables are bad, but you need to be all raw. It's like, well, what do you eat? You're so limited, you're setting yourself up for failure. So don't let, and there's lots of others out there, but that's just one that I'll mention, please, Think about what you hear and don't just assume because somebody says it, including what we're saying, don't just assume that because somebody says it, it must be true. Or because, you know, John is kind and saying, you know, from earning a doctorate degree, we've learned a lot about science, we get to go out and have clinical experience, but that alone doesn't mean you know everything. So, you just, you just, you know, Everything isn't bad for you. Every, just about, you know, various healthy foods have their place and they all need to be implemented in a rational, appropriate way. Uh, and there's some individual variation with that and you can be successful long term. That's what this is all about. And cool, the comments I would say regarding that is just like, what I try to do is like eat a variety of foods. So if I had, you know, cauliflower yesterday, I'm not going to eat it then you know today like I'm like, I gonna, might. he's gonna eat it like every day and like i always want to rotate so i'm gonna have spinach the next day and actually honestly i don't like cauliflower as much as rick <laughs> and i eat it usually in season which is like the winter time for me like right now i have all kinds of like nice purple cauliflower in my garden i turn cauliflower when i could get it at the wholesale produce terminal like into cauliflower pizza crust that i might have once a week you know and and so i always rotate all my different vegetables so you know i want you guys to also try to you know, get all the different things in so you don't ever just only eat kale every night for dinner because that's what you eat. And Dr. Rick said you can eat a lot of this stuff. Like, if you eat a lot of kale, then you're missing out on spinach. You're missing out on lettuce. You're missing out on dandelion greens. You're missing out on Janera Procomens or longevity spinach or, you know, Malabar spinach. There's so many other kinds of things you could be growing and eating, um, you know, if you always eat the same thing. So always change it up. I think that's another one of my keys to success. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, I don't get quite the variety that John does, but we do mix them. I mean, we have several staples, but then, you know, it branches out depending on the season and what's available and, and other things and, you know, what kind of cool stuff seeds John <laughs> might bring over that we put in our garden that year, and then we have some other cool stuff. Um, right. So that's five. What's number six? Number six, obtain high-quality, affordable food. And there's many sources I'm just going to kind of read off from our table of contents here. There's farmers markets, wholesale produce markets, produce buying clubs, uh, CSA, community supported agriculture programs, Costco. They've really bumped up their organic stuff in recent years and other wholesale clubs. Mail order, sometimes you can get specialty foods and specialty fruits. Mail ordered, we can take advantage of uh, modern transportation in our modern world. A few that John might have some comments about here, too. Outdoor garden, indoor garden, and, you know, there's even other sources as well. And for my wife and I, the, the two ones that stand out the most is we get the majority of our produce these days from a place called Earl's Organics. That, um, you know, I had been there a couple times in past years, and then John gets credit here. So one day, it was maybe five years ago or so, you had been going there, and you're like, hey, Rick, you want to go down to Earl's? And I went with John and just bought, you know, cases of all this produce. And it was so awesome. The stuff was so fresh. It was like half the price of the retail store. And I didn't have to bring, you know, eight bags to the store to put all the bananas in. And they put them in upside down and they smush them. It was just cases of food. And I came home just like, I felt so victorious. I had all this food. And, and I told John, I'm like, I don't think I can ever go back after this. And ever <laughs> since then... We're regulars there, about twice a month we go. Basically our grocery shopping isn't some foofy, fancy, it's a loading dock with trucks, but they bring the pallet loader of, of cases of lettuce and oranges and bananas and cauliflower and tomatoes and zucchini and dandelion greens and cucumbers and uh, probably a few other things I'm missing out on. Those are the staples. And, and you know we just have tons of food around 
And then we fill in a little bit at Costco. They have just, I mean, they have, their prices are as good as at this wholesale uh, grower, wholesale supplier, excuse me. And um, so we fill in there with carrots and other things that we can buy 10 pounds of instead of maybe 25 pounds of or, or real excessive amounts. And then a little bit at the health food store. But we really keep that to a minimum. And occasionally we order some things like some sun-dried tomatoes or, you know, uh, uh, things like that. So those are our two things. And then more and more, especially with John's good influence, uh, especially in the summer, we eat a lot of tomatoes and zucchini and lettuce uh, from our garden and, uh, and tree collards year-round from the garden, too. So, so and it just, I, when we have a lot of food around, sometimes the big challenge is, oh my gosh, we have so many bananas, we better make sure we eat them before they get too ripe. And if there's still some left over, we freeze them. Or, hey, if we don't eat the lettuce, it's going to go bad. So it's like we have additional incentive <laughs> to eat lots of raw fruits and vegetables that we love because there's so many of them around. So, I mean, having that stuff around the house is just so key because sometimes when you're hungry and you're busy and you're survival instinct and your hunger is taking over and, and outweighing your rational thought, um, when you have that stuff around, that's what you're going to eat. And so just really critical piece of uh, the equation there. So Dr. Rick, I totally agree with you on obtaining high quality, affordable food. And you know, I go through great links to get my food to be as affordable as possible. And also just show you guys how you guys could make it as affordable as possible as well. I visited many of the different wholesale produce terminals around the country making videos at many of them for you guys to show you guys exactly how to buy produce whether you live in the san francisco bay area i have videos on showing you guys where to go how to shop it whether you guys live in the la area you could go to the la wholesale produce terminal and get produce there i think i have other videos maybe like in dc and i hope to get to the one in new york outside new york city yeah and, we did one there. yeah yeah fun. um but anyways one of the most important things is have the food available and around, right? I shop at the wholesale produce terminal, unlike Rick that has, he, he buys these certain things and has general staples that he gets every time. I'm kind of like, let's see what I'm going to find for a good deal today. And I walk around the whole terminal just finding the cheapest stuff. And guess what? If I do that every time I get something different and I always have new ingredients, new fruits and vegetables to play with, to make things out of. Plus then for me personally, I have a whole backyard garden full of vegetables 365 days a year, something's always growing in my garden. So I try to go to my garden and harvest vegetables first before I start using the things that I bought. Of course, most of the time I buy, mo I buy mostly fruits and I uh, grow most of my vegetables uh, you know, that I can depending on the time of year. I mean, another thing I do besides going to the wholesale produce terminal, which I only do once a month, and then I load up like a bunch of stuff in three fridges because uh, I'm a little bit further away uh, from the wholesale produce terminal these days, is I go visit farmer's markets to get things I can't get at the produce terminal, like I get purple carrots at the farmer's market. Um, I'll also go to local health food stores and make my run to different ones, whether it's Sprouts, Natural Grocers, Whole Foods, even Trader Joe's, right? Each one of those places sometimes have some good deals or have different organic produce items uh, that I can't find anywhere else. And of course, I love to shop uh, the warehouse club store. So Costco, if you're in California, you guys are lucky because they have a wider selection. And that's what Dr. Rick is talking about um, of organic produce. Most Costco's in most of the country that I visited, you know, they have a handful of things, yeah, a few, yeah, a few but... things, which which is still good because they always generally have organic carrots wherever you live. And that's one of my best and least expensive juicy ingredients, and they're a nutrient-dense vegetable, in my opinion, anti-cancer. Um, and depending on where you live, they may be getting more things in, so always pay attention and be aware. Like my local Costco, they had like some organic melons and things lately, um, but it just depends, so check out. And I'm also a member of Sam's Club. You know, I got a cheap Sam's Club membership. Sam's Club, not quite as good as Costco, but sometimes you'll find something good there. They generally have the organic uh, greens mixes and... Um, also the carrots, organic, and some other things. But, you know, shop around for the best deals you guys can. Buy in bulk and, you know, and use it before you lose it, right? Whether you, that means like for me, if I have a lot of stuff going bad, I'll just juice it real quick, right? It might mean I'm going to dehydrate it, you know, into some crackers or some green powders or, you know, I might blend them up, right? I might 
you know, if I have a lot of apples, I've been lately juicing them all, and then I'll make some, I'll use that to sweeten granola or oats, then I'll dehydrate, then I could have, oh, anyways, there's a lot of different ways to use the produce, but have it available. Oh, and then of course I can't not mention, grow your own food. It's one of the cheapest <laughs> things, invest in the seeds, throw it out in your garden. I have a whole YouTube channel, Growing Your Greens, dedicated to teach you guys how you guys grow outdoors and indoors. I'm not gonna get more into that, but that's definitely the best way to have the cheapest food, but also more importantly, the highest quality, something that you're not gonna find at any of the wholesale produce stores, natural food stores, or anywhere else I shop. I like to shop first out of my backyard garden. And you know, along those lines, there's something we didn't put on the list, and it's not a major staple year round, but depending on where you live, like here in the fall, we have neighbors with persimmon trees. Mm. And you know, some of, there's one guy here, he's got like a, a, a patio area, and his persimmon trees in the patio, but a lot of it comes out over onto the sidewalk. And he's like, yeah, that just, you know, we have enough from the patio area, but anything you want to take outside of that, go for it. Yeah, and foraging. He's excited because we're the cleanup crew, right? We <laughs> clean up that stuff before they fall and make a mess in his yard. And we're excited because we come home with 50, 60, 80 persimmons and we let them get ripe and, and then we eat those. So that could be another potential source. Oh yeah, and visit and farms. They're, they're so I visit free. farms near me actually and I do you pick farms, which is a great resource. Wow, that sounds yeah. cool too. Yeah, you guys can't even do that here in California, but I can do it in Nevada. Well, <laughs> every place has its yeah, pluses and minuses. All right, so, so we're up to number seven here. And these might go a little bit quicker, and they're a little bit more mindset issues in terms of actually dietary strategy because you got to have the food part right, but a lot of what's going on up here drives the whole experience and sets the foundation and decides which path you're going to take and how you're going to go about things. And some strategies work really well, and others don't work as well, and then people don't stick with it over the long term, and we want all of you to stick with this over the long term because we know how much of a benefit it makes in people's lives and we want the world to be a healthier place. So number seven here, we have go for it, but don't worry about being perfect. So by go for it, it's like, look, um, you don't have to be perfect, but don't, don't just slack off either. Don't just say, okay, well, I got a microgreen in today and I'm going to eat another one tomorrow, or one leaf, you know, I mean, <laughs> let, let's, you know, extreme, that's not going to do it. So you want to really get as many fruits and vegetables in as you can, eat a variety of things, uh, you know, all that stuff. But when you get to the point where you're like, oh my God, I'm, I'm really worried about, you know, if I did it exactly right, and oh my god, I, I, I was, I, on chronometer, I, I was 50 milligrams low on calcium, and what am I going to do? I don't have anything in the fridge, and I'm going to miss that today, and oh my god, I got to a double digit percentage of fat today, oh my god, it's all over, or I ate too much fruit, I ate, ate some raisins, oh my god, I, I'm going to get be diabetic tomorrow and overweight, and I'm going to have high cholesterol and triglycerides, and oh my god, I ate some kale, and I ruined my thyroid, ah! Okay, so don't be that perfectionistic, and so we, we covered a lot of that stuff already, but at the same time, make meaningful efforts to do your best, to really make a difference, because token changes will get you token results. Bigger changes, when they are strategized properly, will get you bigger results. And then guess what? Part of those results are you feel good, you notice the difference, and then you have positive incentive to keep going. It's not just hypothetical, it's not just something on lab work, it's not just, okay, I'm going to live to 93 instead of 91. You really feel the difference, and then you're, you're going to want to keep going. So. You got it, and for everybody that mix is a little bit different. Go as far as you can and still feel comfortable and free about it. And when you start feeling like you're, you're getting into jail, maybe it's time to just back off a little and make sure you're enjoying it because then you're going to keep it up over the long term. Wow, and I think that part of that uh, you know, tip there for me is don't worry about being perfect, right? And what is perfection? like? 
Yeah, what you're, is that anyway? It's defined differently. It's, your perfection is defined by you and your head and what you make up. So I want to remind you guys that you set up your rules. If perfect is being 100% raw for the rest of your life like I had, right? And now I'm only 99% raw and eat so mostly the, fruits and vegetables with very few. I'm, 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 I'm a failure. Oh my God, I've only done 99%. He, he could think that, right? But I could. You don't. No, but I think, still that, doing it. I think that, you know, I think what is, if you want to define perfect is, Perfect is eating as many fruits and vegetables as you could possibly cram in your body each and every day and minimizing or Comf comfortably comfort cram comfort, comfort comfortable not you. stress <laughs> comfortably and uh, you know completely eliminating all the processed foods junk foods and animal foods uh, you know and I, I think that to me is like that's perfect and, and making making your target wide like if you're pay, playing like darts if you just hit the dartboard, you won, right? It's, you don't have to hit that bullseye. You just got to get in the general area and you're totally good. So, you know, make your rules of perfection, you know, and easy to obtain. Yeah, absolutely. Set yourself up to win, not to fail. Yep. And I mean, if John thought that because he wasn't 100% raw now, he might be one of those YouTubers who's <laughs> taken down his raw videos and, and have gone in a different direction where maybe there's a little more leeway and that's what he liked better about it. it, it you know, sometimes people get caught up in that and then they misattribute why they failed. So set yourself up for success. And, and you know, easier said than done sometimes, but, uh, you know, we, we can all do that and find what works the best for us. Cool, Rick. So what is the next tip? Okay, number eight, remind yourself of all the rewards you will reap. Mm. So number one, I was saying before, is that you, you feel better right away. So that's an instant kind of systemic reminder. And that's really nice. But, you know, if sometimes like with any other goal, sometimes it would might be more fun if like, if you want to get all A's in school or, or do really well academically, it might be more fun to go out to a party or to go mountain biking with your friends that weekend or you know do something else but if you remind yourself hey this is important to me and either you want to get into a good school or, or do whatever the get a scholarship you know earn a degree or something you want to keep that goal in mind out there and then that way you're feeling like you're working towards something positive instead of avoiding something negative you're like oh I didn't go to the party that blows you know, my friends are having fun and I'm not, you know, th that's not going to be good. So, but if you remind yourself, so, you know, you want to be healthy, you want to feel good, you want to feel great into your old age, you want to keep up with your grandkids, you want to be there for your great grandkids and, you know, keep those things in mind and that just helps propel you forward. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. Like, make something like a vision board where you could actually see the ideal you, that, yeah. or whether you want to, like, you know, even more important than a vision board is actually visualize in your brain the person you want to be, and know that that's what you'll what's going to happen if you continue on, you know, eating high volumes of fruits and vegetables comfortably. <laughs> right there, you go. Right, right. So, and and the board <laughs> can be the reminder to get all this mm. stuff going inside. So they 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 work synergistically. Uh, number nine, kind of along those lines, remember the big picture. And part of what we, why I say this is it comes into the perfectionism thing again, is that the big picture is to eat a lot of fruits and vegetables, get enough sleep, get some exercise, enjoy your life, um, connect with other people. Those are the, the big things. So if you go out to a restaurant once a month and you eat something not perfect, that's one meal. That's not the big picture. So you don't let yourself get off track and beat yourself up because of that. So again, you just keep, if you do really well, most of the time, you're doing great. And for some people, because that's not perfect, they're, they're off track. And, and you know, they're, they're taking their raw videos down and, and they're having a big problem. They're, they're, you know, criticizing the raw food movement because it didn't work for them. And, um, you know, again, when you're just, again, keeping that big picture in mind and not getting too obsessed about every detail, it's so much easier and you're so much more likely to keep it up and you're so much more likely to have a mastery approach as opposed to um, struggling my way through. And, and it's, you know, your, your chances of long-term success go up exponentially. I mean, I would just like to reiterate too on that is, is diet is just one part <laughs> of the entire picture, you know, like Dr. Rick said, get enough sleep, exercise, I like to say, live a peaceful life versus a stressful life. 
Because, I mean, if you're stressed out, even if you're eating the best, healthiest foods, or you're not getting enough sleep, I mean, all these could play a factor. And then that's why raw foods didn't work, because you're just a naturally stressed out person. Even though you're maybe doing it the best way you can, you got to eliminate the stress. So pay attention to that big picture. There's so many other things having to do with your health besides just the food you're eating. Although the food, it's an important one. Yeah, I mean, it may be worth it, it, it if, if, if your situation is such that you go over to the, your local grocery store to get some food instead of driving to Los Angeles to meet John at the farmer's market there. That could be, you might not sleep, you might have to drive all night. So you got to weigh all that stuff out and just keep remembering what the most important things are. Uh, number 10, find support. Mm. You know, it is so much easier to do things when you you have support and when you know other people are doing things. I mean, human beings are social creatures. We are hardwired to be social. We had to cooperate. We had to, you know, get together in communities and, uh, you know, a, a community of people can lift some rocks and, and move some branches and, you know, set things up, whereas one person can't do that by themselves. So because we're hardwired that way, um, it's so important for us to, uh, find other people who are living this way and eating this way, or who are at least encouraging as opposed to discouraging about it. And um, it's easier than ever these days. I mean, back when John and I were getting started, you couldn't, there weren't all, all these, you know, YouTube videos, there weren't uh, support groups and, and, you know, Facebook groups online and all this other stuff. So those are really great things to take advantage of as long as you're not getting caught up in myths being perpetuated that'll throw you. So you got to be selective there. Um, but I mean, you know, John came over tonight and we did an interview with him and he ate a big salad with us. And it's just always fun when we have friends over who eat gigantic salads. We're like, ah, maybe we're not that weird. You know, <laughs> we are to the rest of the world, but we know enough people, other people who do this. And it just, it feels good. You know, we feel more of a sense of community and that just gives us incentive to uh, to keep at it. Yeah, I mean, I would definitely reiterate like things like um, local meetup groups, right? Or go mm. to different raw food events around the world and, you know, check those out and, and meet other people doing this and make connections and meet people that you could have a phone buddy with, you know? <laughs> um, I think that's it's super critical to have the support to share your journey with somebody that will support you, you know, because most of the world is going to think you're crazy for eating fruits and vegetables and raw even. Um, even just watching some of my YouTube videos. I mean, that's kind of a more of a one-way support instead of getting feedback, but at least videos, if you can't do anything else, will give you some motivation um, over the time and, and keep you hopefully motivated to do it. And I have over 500 videos, so even if you watch like one video a day, make it a point to watch one of my videos a day, you're going to be good for a whole year. <laughs> so. Yeah, so John can be your, your talking vision board <laughs> with the interesting backgrounds and all the places he goes and stuff, yeah. and it just keeps the conversation going. So that's what the support part is all about. Okay, number 11. Uh, depending on the situation, this can often come in really handy. Um, and, and especially uh, as my wife and I as clinicians, we put this in. Get yourself tested. Because how you feel is really, really important. But oftentimes, and this is, again, it's got to be qualified. When a, somebody who knows what they are looking at, so critical, that can make or break the next thing. But when someone knows what they're looking at can analyze some lab work, appropriate lab work that you've had done. Um, you can oftentimes tweak things and head things off at the past that could be a problem in the future, but don't necessarily have to be. Now again, you have to be very careful there because that concept I have seen abused in certain areas. So someone will say, well, this test shows this and you know, the rhetoric in this for particular camp is if this persists, you're going to have all these problems. So aren't you lucky that you came to me and now I can put you on this extensive protocol that I make money on and, and you know, you won't have a problem in the future. So you have to be careful of that um, and, and not allow abuse to come in there. So, but again, when it's, when it's appropriately done, you can oftentimes see things that would be would manifest as a problem in several years but you can take care of it now so let, let, i was talking about thyroid function before i know my thyroid's working well even with the mass quantity of raw cruciferous vegetables but let's just say you are going to have a, a hypo low thyroid problem five years down the road 
you can oftentimes see that on lab work five years before. So you can like look into your crystal ball and you can make some changes and not have that be a problem in the future. So when appropriately done, and there's a lot of inappropriate stuff out there, I'm sorry to say, but when appropriately done, um, lab testing can be extremely helpful for fine tuning and for heading off problems in the future. And sometimes can even make or break whether you're gonna stay on a healthy path or not. Yeah, I mean, I would just definitely say I agree with that. Get your blood checked, get your blood tested, as well as other tests. I do all, I get blood tested, but I can do all kinds of other tests as well. There's so many different kinds of testing. I think they're, they're good to be, be smart about it and do as many as you can. So you could kind of get like at least a checkpoint to see where you're at and then maybe get some recommendations from somebody that is qualified to check somebody's, you know, blood who's on a plant-based raw vegan diet, like Dr. Rick here. I mean, not to tout him, but... He's, you know, helped me, uh, you know, determine how my blood is doing and what my nutrients are and how I could maybe adjust and change it, even become better to, you know, to make sure you're not going to be B12 deficient, to make sure you're getting enough vitamin D, to make sure you got the, the proper amounts of calcium and magnesium and you got omega good... Omega-6 to 3 ratio. Yeah, omega-6 to so 3 ratio. Oh, I just got an omega-3 test done recently, actually. Ah. Um, but, yeah, you want to get tested so you know where you're at. So then if it's not right, you could change before it turns into a super huge big problem and you start getting you start shaking because you're B12 deficient because you never got tested we, and you think you're getting all the nutrients from vegetables. Yeah, John and I know a, a, a mutual acquaintance who, who we saw that happen with. And uh, it's very unfortunate. Doesn't have to happen. Doesn't have to happen. So yeah, I mean, that's much more well known these days compared to when we see, saw it happen. But um, yeah, exactly. So um, yeah, and actually check the link down below. I'll put another episode I did with Dr. Rick about getting tested. Yeah, and I was gonna say, is, is, is I gotta you can help me refresh my memory. Didn't didn't we make an episode where I like you had some lab work done? Well, that one never. Kind of that's work? gonna get published soon. Oh, we did it, but it's so it's an upcoming event. Right, but I did do an okay. episode with you on the importance of getting tested already. Okay, awesome, <laughs> awesome. John, I got my omega threes, man. Yeah, I got my memory. I'm good. He's, yeah, that's right. It's a good thing. But uh, yeah, John's got a lot of stuff in the queue all ready to go and it. <laughs> Keep you all inspired and, and educated so that you guys can improve and do better always. Absolutely. We're so on the same page with that. We, I mean, I, I can, if I may speak for both of us, this has made such a difference in our lives. And, uh, and we just, we, we, you know, naturally want that for all of you. So in our various ways, that's why we're doing what we do. And it, it's always fun when we, you know, interview you and, and you make these videos with us. And uh, we're, we're always happy when our paths cross. Uh, in, in that area or, or with that theme in mind. Cool. So we're actually down, down to, the to the last, last number 12. Don't be afraid to change mm. as you go along. So there are some people that, again, they get like, okay, I've got to be this way or I've got to be that way. And if that particular way doesn't work, it's like trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. You've, you've made your box too limited. You jump out and it doesn't work. Sometimes it's like, well, look, a uh, few more nuts and seeds work for me, or more fruit works for me, or more vegetables work for me, or whatever the case. And that can change with your activity level, with, uh, you know, the, the time of the year, with your age, you know, w with all different things. So, uh, you know, don't be afraid to experiment a little bit. Not like I'm, you know, going from one extreme to the other, like we see so much, but within the healthy realm, you know, it's the fine-tuning, the tweaking... Um, you know, and, and, and education is part of that too because that helps you figure out what you can try versus just one extreme approach or the other. So um, being flexible. Um, you know, John, we interviewed you recently and you, you were kind of giving a, it sounded to me like, because we're both fans and we have been for a long time, it sounds like the, the Tony Robbins ultimate success formula. He's like, number one, know your outcome. So you want to be healthy, you want to enjoy your life, you want to feel good, all that stuff. Number two, Notice if it's working, and if it is, great, keep on the same path, but if it's not, you don't keep doing the same thing thinking you're going to get a different result. You modify your approach, and then you see if that's working or not, and you keep going till you get at it. You, you know, so, so that flexibility is just so, so key. And, and, you know, these days it's like, okay, this person wants to make a name for themselves and they're carving out their niche. And, and then on the one hand, that's beneficial because people know what everyone else stands for who is educating others. 
But on the other hand, it creates this wake of confusion out there and people don't know what to do. So you all should get educated, listen to different people, be open-mindedly skeptical about what you hear, but within that, you can also fine-tune for yourself. And, um, and, you know, it's really up to everybody to do that, either on your own or with some guidance. Uh, I don't know, I could go on for another hour about the importance <laughs> of flexibility, and I know John's waiting to chime in with that, too, because we've talked about that, uh, the importance of that before. Yeah, I think it's especially important to be flexible on a raw foods diet, to not maybe be all raw. Like, you know, recently I made a video, like, 10 foods that I eat that actually aren't raw that I, that I eat. And so I've become a lot more flexible in my more mature <laughs> and uh, wise uh, years uh, doing the raw foods diet. So I include, you know, uh, certain uh, heat processed foods because I think they're gonna be beneficial for me and not to say that they're gonna be beneficial for you, but you might wanna take a look at the video link I'll post down below, the 10 foods I eat that aren't raw that you may wanna include because these will basically open your doors, expand your repertoire of foods that you, you can include on your path, on your diet, and they can provide further health benefits to balance you out or, or help you out. And that's why I make these videos for you guys, right? And so I think that's probably the, the last comments I have, but I had another thing for you guys. Did you guys enjoy this episode learning about how you could maintain and stay on a raw foods diet for a long period of time? I think some of the most important things we talked about today were like, number one, getting educated. Number two, getting some support, right? And Dr. Rick, what program do you have coming up that people could get more educated and get more support? So, just so happens, we have a program coming up. And if you've made it this far and watched all this, you're a perfect candidate for our upcoming Raw Food Mastery Summit 2018, where we interview John and 20 other uh, people with a lot of expertise in the field of raw food. We're pretty selective about who we invited to participate and we interviewed them for about 45 minutes or so each about what it takes to master a raw food diet which will allow you and, and for each person it might look a little different and that will therefore allow you to keep this up over the long term and keep getting the benefit because once again we want that for all of you. And so the theme here in order to master this to keep it up long term is there's two basic categories of topics that we'll discuss. One of them is the dietary strategies. A lot of the things we covered here, but you're gonna to get to hear many different speakers and many different perspectives cover this in different ways. And the other general category is the mindset strategies about making sure it works for you. And by the way, you know, I just wanted to say in the last thing you were saying, John, if somebody has been 100% raw and, and they've found a particular way that works for them and they're going for it and they feel great, we're not here to talk you out of that. So I don't, we don't want anyone to yeah. misinterpret our be flexible. Okay, so if something's working for you, awesome, keep it up. But I would but also recommend not, getting tested to make sure it's working for you even though you feel good. Make sure on all be. levels, subjectively and objectively, that it's working for you. And if so, great. If not, then be flexible enough to modify things a little bit instead of going off the deep end and quitting and saying it was, uh, it was too hard. So that's what we're, we're offering on, on the Raw Food Mastery Summit. Cool. So like, there's going to be like over 20 different individual raw food educators on your summit, Dr. Rick. So people are going to get to hear a wide variety of things like my opinions, but also many different opinions and tips from many other people that have been doing this for a long time. I think most of them are most over like 20, years 20 are plus over. years. So a few exceptions. Lots. So I mean, I think one of the things is you can learn from people that have been successful on this path and in this uh, you know, summit that they're doing that's free for you guys to go to, which all you guys watching this right now should sign up. So check the link right down below. I'll post it as the first comment. Also, it'll be in the description. So click that link, sign up for it. If you get in now, it's gonna be free, but if you wait till later, you're gonna probably have to buy it. So get, put your email list, uh, put your email in there now. It's gonna be free. Do you have any other comments or words of wisdom yeah, you'd like to share? It, last year we did sell our summit. This year we're not going to. Mm. So the thing is, because you can't buy it, you don't wanna miss out <laughs> on it. Occasionally we're, you know, we will give a, a, a replay for the weekend or something like that, but you know, 
If you're not available then, so the, the sooner you sign up, the better. And, and I will also say we have a few plant-based doctors who are not necessarily totally raw food oriented, but who have a real, uh, a, a lot of excellent wisdom to share because as you know, John and I have discussed a lot that the foundation of a healthy raw food diet is a healthy plant-based diet. If you don't have that as a foundation, you, you're so much less likely to be successful with raw food. So we lay some of that foundation and then we build upon that and say more fresh fruits and vegetables and fewer cooked things tend to be healthier for most people depending on where your mix is. So it's a, it's, it's a wide variety of stuff. Um, looking at the dietary and mindset strategies that help you stay on the healthiest path possible from a mastery level for the long term. Awesome, yeah. So if you guys want to eat more fruits and vegetables, even if you're not raw, you're going to ever go raw, one of the best things, because there'll be so many different strategies and ways you could eat more fruits and vegetables, and to me, that's a little what raw foods is about. So um, I guess uh, any other links, Dr. Rick, if somebody wants to learn more about you and your wife and what you guys do? Yeah, so our primary website is rawfoodeducation.com, and from there, there's uh, information about courses that we teach on long-term raw food nutrition. There are links to our YouTube channels. We don't have as many videos as John, but we got a lot of good stuff on there. You can watch my how much cauliflower I eat video, and you can see my lab work on there. You can see uh, a nutrient analysis of oranges only versus taking some oranges away and adding vegetables, and then taking a few more oranges away and adding some nuts and seeds, and you'll see the nutrient profile balance out. All sorts of good stuff on our YouTube channels and our blog, and so uh, a lot of great resources there at rawfoodeducation.com. Cool, yeah, I'll post links down below in the description, so check that out. But first, before you even go to those links, Make sure you uh, click the first link in the comments to put your email address in there to get that summit. It's a wealth of knowledge. This is the third year I've done it. And, you know, the episodes are packed with knowledge for free for the taking for you guys. So make sure you get on the good deal. So uh, I, guess, uh, I guess the final thing I'd like to say is if you guys enjoyed this episode with Dr. Rick, I don't get to do these as much as I'd like to, hey, give a thumbs up. I'll try to get a hold of Dr. Rick and come back and do more episodes because the episodes, in my opinion, that I do with Dr. Rick are some of the best episodes on my channel because, you know, you learn a whole bunch of information that could solidly impact, change your life uh, for the better. Also, be sure to share this video with somebody else. Share this video with somebody that's uh, into raw foods, that's already doing a plant-based diet, because in my opinion, you know, raw foods or eating more fresh fruits and vegetables are the next level of a plant-based diet, or even share with people that are eating junk foods, because if they're eating junk foods, the more fresh fruits and vegetables you can eat, and the less junk foods you eat, the better, even if you're still going to eat the junk foods, you know, <laughs> whatever, fruits and vegetables are the best foods on the planet, and this episode, and Dr. Rick is, is going to share with you guys in the summit, uh, really good. Also, be sure to click that subscribe button right now below so you don't miss out on any of my new and upcoming episodes. I've coming out about every five to seven days, you know, where I show up or what you'll be learning on my YouTube channel. Also, be sure to check my past episodes, over 500 episodes on this channel at this time, teach you guys all aspects on how you guys could eat a healthy, plant based, fruit and vegetable dominated raw diet. So, uh, with that, my name is John Kohler with OKRaw.com. We'll see you next time. And until then, remember, keep eating your fresh fruits and vegetables. They're always the best. Bye bye.